Do you know it is Menopause Awareness Month? I do know it's Menopause Awareness Month. And by coincidence, we have a, <laughs> a men- an episode on menopause for y'all today. <laughs> y'all. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just a coincidence. Now, yeah. we were informed by Dr. Jen Huber, who is the yeah. menopause nutritionist on Instagram and run, has a pod- podcast herself called The Midlife Feast. She is an intuitive eating counselor, a, oh gosh, darn it, I wish I had her bio in front of me. Naturopathic doctor. Naturopathic doc. Okay. Nutritionist. Yeah. We can just we can just keep all of that. You just leave all that? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's just all that. Keep it raw. And And more. more. All that. (laughs) We don't want to say that's all she is. Yeah. She she speaks to the intersection of you know, she's a safe place to talk about menopause for people who are in this space, who are working on the relationship with food and body image. Uh, And we talked to her today about the difference between menopause and perimenopause, the hormone changes that go along with that and what that does to to our bodies, to our appetites, to our moods, and also how to navigate that in a way that is not extreme or alarmist, you know, how to think about a changing body, like a significantly changing body during this time of life. And, And I think that even if you're not in menopause or perimenopause, the episode is worth listening to, especially towards the end, we get to the value of talking about this and knowing about this stuff earlier. So keep listening. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and I just want to say the message is a really hopeful one. Mm. It's a really hopeful one. And I, and I like that too. But yeah, we hope you enjoy the episode. Hi, Jen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> see? See how good we are? Um, so no. We, we're happy to have you to, uh, here because we've never had a guest to talk about menopause, except Sarah, who has her own history of act of early menopause. So I don't know how much you know about this, Jen. So I have a pituitary tumor, which okay. wiped out my estrogen, progesterone, prolactin, all of that a lot. And that was sort of my mid my mid twenties. That oh, hit gosh. me, and I was on the contraceptive pill at the time, so that just masked all the oh, symptoms of it as such. And the only reason I even found out there was anything hormonally wrong, apart from the fact I was feeling rubbish and didn't know why, was because I stopped taking the contraceptive pill and I didn't menstruate. And that's when they obviously wow. looked into it and found out what was going on. So, so you also had a crash landing into menopause. I did, but I had no idea. And also I don't I wonder, Jen, whether mine was a bit different because as I understand menopause, and obviously we'll get into it a lot more during this episode. A lot of people, as they go through menopause, like the hormones are going up and down, like there's these fluctuations happening. Whereas my understanding, because of the reason why I stopped producing estrogen, that mine would have come down steady or suddenly. So I I sometimes wonder if it would have been different. And that's actually, I mean, that is a really good question. Um, One of the things that we're just starting to see more research on is actually looking at the experiences of people who go into medical, surgical or, you know, kind of natural, spontaneous menopause. And there does seem to be a difference. And so if you have a full hysterectomy, or if you have, you know, medical menopause induced by chemotherapy, potentially a, you know, pituitary tumor, something that puts you on a different timeline than maybe mother nature would have originally intended, that the experience of it is very different, right? So normally perimenopause takes eight to 10 years averages four to five, but that's a much longer period of time to adjust to this new hormonal soup, as I call it, than, you know, having those hormones removed suddenly for whatever reason. Yeah. That makes sense. So when people come to you for support with menopause, what is it that they're coming to you with? Like, what is it you're helping people navigate? What are you seeing? I know that's a big question, but I'm interested in the patterns you see. Well, And I think that if I can give a little bit of context about how I got to do this work, it might make a bit more sense. So I've been a registered dietitian for 25 years. I've been a naturopathic doctor in Canada for 20 years, and I've been an intuitive eating counselor for the better part of the last 10 years, kind of give or take some gaps in there with, with training and kids in life. But in general, I've been working in this nutrition, health, women's health, menopause space, for, you know, 25 years. And there have been different trends over time. 
you know, and what I really started to notice about 15 years ago was this focus on hormones. You were starting to see things like hormone detoxes, hormone testing, and hormones being cause and consequence and cure for pretty much anything that you could go through. And and I think a lot of that was somewhat, the interest in that was very warranted because of course we know that there are major gaps in women's health care. There's a lot of symptoms that are dismissed. We weren't even including women in research until the early 90s as a, as a default. So we know that there's a lot we don't know. So it makes sense that we were saying, okay, well, what's different, right? Well, what's different is that we tend to have these hormonal seasons in our life and as we started to look into the most common symptoms that women have, fatigue, mood changes, body changes, it was an easy, I guess, kind of leap to say, well, hormones are to blame. So probably 15 years ago, I started to really see these hormone things popping up. And 10 years ago, I had my own crash landing into early perimenopause around 37 and was fully menopausal by 44. So I was also kind of in the thick of it while I was learning about it. And at the same time was learning about the harms of dieting and diet culture and really, really did not love the food is medicine narrative around hormone health and women's health, especially. So all of that kind of led me to do what I'm doing now. And that means that most of the people that I hear from and and work with are people who feel like they don't know what's going on. They, you know, they feel broken. They feel lost. They don't recognize who they see in the mirror. They're cranky. They're tired. They're hot. They're sweaty. They're hungry. They're, you know, all, all the symptoms that we see promoted and touted as a problem. And the only solution that they've been offered is diet and exercise and, you know, like cut this out, um, you know, never eat this, always eat this, hit the gym six times a day, but not too hard. And, and like, it just seems like the rules keep piling on. So I like to describe what I do is helping people to manage menopause without diets and food rules so that we're really trying to help, you know, I want people to settle in. I want, I want women to lean in to menopause. Like there is so, there are so many good things coming, you know, good things are coming, but you have to be able to lean into it with confidence and not run away in fear. Ooh, And that's kind of where I see so much of um, the, the menopause messaging, right? Steph is wants like, to know what good things are coming. Yeah. I can no, see. I, I just think Steph it's what good things hopeful, are coming. It's such a hopeful, it's such a hopeful position because where, where I'm speaking to people who are dealing with food issues, body image issues, and then piling on the menopause, it like, it is such a compounding factor in this work that, that we do. And to hear like, there's good things coming. I feel like is a, like a life raft in a, in a storm, yeah. you know, like to hear somebody say that I want to hear more about it. Like I'm, I'm okay. I, I feel like that's I such love a to good talk message. About this, Cause this is, I do a lot of myth busting. It's like my favorite thing in the world, right? Because I feel like the menopause world and the nutrition world are so full of bullshit. Hopefully I can swear here, right? There's just so much, there's just so much crap out there that I just love being able to help people sort through the crap essentially. And one of the, the false narratives is that everything sucks after 40, everything goes downhill and you have to fight it tooth and nail. Otherwise you're going to be left in the dust. Like that is currently in, you know, mid to late 2024, that's where we're at with the messaging. And you're really starting to have these polarized views of people wanting to kind of ease into the season. And then other people saying, well, if you're not doing all of these things, then you're, you're, you're doing it wrong, essentially. But when we actually look at the research, there is research out of Australia, 20 year study that compared happiness and mood of postmenopausal women compared it to their premenopausal selves, but also compared it to other premenopausal women and found, you know, they're happier after menopause. There's similar data out of Denmark. Happiness scores are higher, even if there are other things going on. So even if the women who were asked about happiness were achier or had like joint pain and things like that, they still rated themselves and their lives as, as better. So, and now that I'm three years post-menopause, I really want to shout this from the rooftops because I have never felt better. 
my mood is a thousand times more stable than it ever was when I was cycling. My energy is stable. My brain fog has resolved. Like all the things that I, that totally sucked about perimenopause and made me want to like climb into like a cave and just like run away and hide. It did all get better on its Mm -hmm. own. And now I just really am excited for this next season of life without having to worry about periods. Right. Mm -hmm. So I really want people, and that's not just me. Every time I post about this and I ask a a question or a poll in my stories, overwhelmingly 70, 80% of people who respond out of hundreds of responses say that they prefer their life post-menopause. That's, that reminds me of the way you just described that reminds me of the way that I now think about puberty where during puberty, it's so tough. And I mean, I have a 13 year old right now who is just like, we are all over the map. There are lots of mood shifts and and things like that. And it reminds me of how at that time too, there's pathologizing, maybe not of moods, but certainly of weight gain during that time. And like, there's a lot of effort, at least when I was growing up to control body, like what the body changes going. And it's kind of like that, that sets up something that then can continue the rest of our lives. But if we just allow ourselves to move through something, like let the body do what it's doing, there's a messy middle, but, but that there's like, there's patience with that process. Um, and I'm interested to hear the perimenopause versus menopause difference. Um, I'm 45 and I don't know how might this, how might I, how might I tell? (laughs) Well, and that's a great question. So as I described the ages and stages, we have everything that leads up to perimenopause and that's premenopause. So puberty to perimenopause is kind of one stage. Then we enter perimenopause, which is not defined by anything that we can measure at this point. So there is no test for perimenopause. But there are kind of groups of symptoms that can tell us that it is on on the horizon. So if somebody is over the age of 35, some say 40, but I think 35 is a good low bar for that. If you're over the age of 35 and you're noticing changes in your cycle length, so it maybe has gone from 28 days to 26 days or 32 days, if you're noticing changes, and especially if those changes are more than seven days, And if you're noticing changes in the quality of your menstruation, so is it heavier? Are you having more pain, more clots, more cramping? Are you experiencing mood changes? Are you waking up in the middle of the night for the first time? These are all symptoms related to the early perimenopausal changes that are often overlooked or dismissed, which is one of the the big challenges with diagnosing perimenopause is that in my case, I had all of those symptoms, but I was 37. Uh, I had three kids under the age of seven and it wasn't on anyone's radar. Every symptom was dismissed as you're tired, you're busy, you just need more like self-care, you need more downtime. And it wasn't until I started having hot flashes that it really kind of clued in, but that was after two miserable years of, of symptoms. So perimenopause can last up to 10 years on average, four to five And there are two stages, the early stage where you're still having a regular period. And then the later stage where you're often skipping periods. The later stage tends to be more typical with hot flashes, night sweats, missing periods, wondering if you're pregnant, like all of those tropes of a menopausal person that kind of describes really like late menopause in my experience. And then once you've gone 12 months without a period, then you are postmenopausal. but there's no test and there's also no age. So knowing your family history can be helpful. So my mom and grandmother were both menopausal by 45. So once I learned that, which was unfortunately after I figured out that I was in perimenopause, I was able to really see through that lens of, okay, this could be on my horizon. It's not perfect. There are lots of other influences as well, but just knowing your family history is always a good place to start. Yeah. I have so many questions. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I'm like, okay, okay. Um, one one question. What what do you understand about the link between estrogen and appetite? Because my understanding is that estrogen is an appetite suppressant. So like in our cycle, when estrogen is higher, appetite drops. So in menopause, what a lot of people are reporting, and certainly what I experienced had a lot of other hormonal things going on as well. So it's hard to distinguish it. That when estrogen starts dropping appetite increases. Is that your understanding or is there more to it than that? 
Well, I think there probably is more to it than that. It's an area of research that's interesting, but we don't have a lot of research. So we know that there's a relationship, right? Um, and whether or not, you know, adding estrogen, estrogen into the equation it, as a treatment will, will help or change appetite, that much we don't know. But we also know that there are associations with progesterone. So progesterone actually increases your daily energy needs because you know, your body temperature goes up. So people often feel hungrier in the second half of their cycle, partially because progesterone is rising, maybe not necessarily because estrogen is low. So when we're looking at the relationships between estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, leptin, ghrelin, all of those kind of hunger components, there are relationships, but I don't think there's anything that we can hang our hat on at this point and say like, this is absolutely always true. There's a lot of talk as well in the nutrition world about how what you eat, they'll use language like, you know, optimize your hormones or like that your diet can then affect your hormones. What's yeah. your angle on that? You know, as a nutritionist, I feel like this is your area and I sort of bow to your expertise here in terms of, it sounds like in the wellness world, a lot of the claims are over egged, but what, what, what's true in your mind? Yeah. And so I, a lot of it is around, well, most of it is directly tied to weight regulation, right? Blaming the hormone imbalance for body changes, weight changes, and therefore trying to fix the hormone imbalance with food. Usually that involves restriction, counting, tracking, all the usual diet culture kind of tools. And there's not a whole lot of evidence. There actually isn't any evidence that I know of that a particular diet can influence hormones in a measurable way. The one Slight exception to that would be foods that are high in phytoestrogens. So soy foods in particular, but also ground flax and some of the other beans and lentil family members do contain phytoestrogens, which are plant-based estrogen-like compounds that can bind to estrogen receptors. And in my case, they were really helpful at helping me manage hot flashes and night sweats. Um, I think hormone therapy is amazing. It didn't work for me in the way that I wanted it to. So I really did rely on those phytoestrogens to help me navigate that symptomatic period. But when we're talking about the other ways that that term hormone balancing is thrown around, there really isn't any evidence that there are hormone balancing diets. I'm thinking about, I had a flashback as you were talking earlier, back to my days, this was 10 years, I guess we're creeping up on 10 years ago. Dr. Sarah Gottfried. Uh, yes who has, I cannot remember now the names of her books, but she was big into the hormone detoxing, rebalancing your hormones. And there was, it was a food as medicine approach that I was like hook, line and sinker. I, I bought her programs and I, you know, I, I tried everything because I perceived my issues to be hormonal. And is there, so kind of what, what you're saying here is like, there's some credibility to phytoestrogens, for example, as being supportive, but that the, the over-exaggeration of like, you can just revamp your entire uh, hormone panel through food is out. Yeah. That's, that's, that's beyond. Uh, and even just the concept of balance, right? And so if we take 10 people who are the same age, the same reproductive stage, and we measure their hormones at the same day of their cycle, they're all going to be a little different. And so sometimes people really frustrated when they look at a lab report and they see this wide range of normal, but the range is wide because enough people who are normal <laughs> fall into those ranges. And so the amount of estrogen that you can measure at any given time doesn't really have any clinical meaning unless it's outside of those reference ranges. So a lot of the smoke and mirrors of hormone balancing diets is taking a measure measurement for something that may or may not be validated. So it's not usually a blood test. It's usually like a saliva test or a dried urine test, measuring a hormone or a metabolite, applying a treatment and then measuring it again. And at this point in time, we don't really have any evidence that the measurements or the treatments are correlated to each other. So just because you can measure it doesn't mean that it has meaning. And just because you can call it a treatment and say that it's treating the thing without meaning doesn't mean that it's doing what you think it's doing. So I think a lot of the understanding about hormones, there are whiffs of truth in, in what is being said. So yes, fiber, for example, I think is a 
reasonable thing to include more of because it does have effects on the types and amounts of gut bacteria, which in turn influence things like hormone metabolism. But we have no credible, reliable way to measure that at this point. So when, you know, people are selling poop tests and saying that they can measure your estrogen metabolism in your poop, they can measure it, but we don't actually have clinically validated data to tell us what it means, mm. right? And so I think that's where it can get really confusing and understandably confusing when there's a test available because it seems like it should be reliable yeah. and yet it's not, but there's a whiff of truth weaved into that, that makes okay. it hard. So I think a lot of people tuning into this episode are going to be tuning in to hear about how much of it, of this is true that menopause is a time where your body is, whether it's due to upregulation of appetite, you know, or just are there truths to body changes, weight changes that are part of the natural cycle of this process. And that the invitation is to control this somehow and to use food or exercise to do so intermittent fasting also like the use of that, because I have heard, you know, once you're in menopause and postmenopause, that that's a safer thing to do than it is when you're hormonal. So piecing together all these, all these little tidbits of information about how to control weight during this time. And is there a relationship between the fact that we are, you know, in the same way, puberty, we, we put weight on for reasons like is, is there, is the same thing happening now? Yeah, that's such a great question. So we do know that body mass increases as people go through the menopause transition and estimates are anywhere from five to 20 pounds on average, which means some are, will gain less, some will gain more. And we tend to see kind of the most dramatic rise in that perimenopause period, which is doubly unfortunate because it's when we're already feeling like a pile of garbage often, we're not sleeping, we're moody, and now our body's changing and it feels like we gain weight overnight and it just feels like everything is happening all at once. But it is happening and it's happening for reasons that we mostly understand. One of the reasons is that we go through a redistribution of assets, as I call it. So as our estrogen levels in particular are declining, we go from that pear shape to more of an apple shape. So even if the scale isn't changing, if you're someone who still uses a scale regularly, even if the scale isn't changing, what you see in the mirror and how your clothes fit will change. And the other thing that tends to happen is a bit of a convergence of kind of life. So by the time we get into the age range for, for spontaneous menopause anyway, we are likely to be at a time when things are slowing down. We probably don't have young kids. We're probably not as busy in our day to day. And because we are also experiencing this age related change in muscle mass, it's a little bit harder to build and maintain, but not impossible, but you know, it requires a little bit more thought and effort there tends to be a bit of a slowing down in that metabolism as well. So just meaning that we have less muscle mass kind of driving metabolism. So all of these things kind of happen at once, which, you know, feels like a really cruel twist of fate. But what, what we also see is that it's not just the body that's changing. We also know that it's a period of risk for body image dysmorphia. And so changes in body image it has also really clearly emerged as, you know, perimenopause is a risk period for that. And so, you know, when we look at what happens in puberty, we can see that there are a lot of parallels to what's happening in perimenopause. Some people even say that it's, you know, reverse puberty, but we know that the, the brain is densely populated with estrogen receptors. It is acutely sensitive to the changes in estrogen. We know that from puberty, pregnancy, right? I mean, the baby blues, if you've ever had a baby, that 48 hour mark, that's like a timer that goes off and you cry for three days, you know, like our brain is acutely sensitive to changes in estrogen and progesterone. And as a result, how we feel really changes too. And what I really hope that, you know, women can be taught as part of this, how to prepare for perimenopause that, you know, what to expect when you're not expecting perimenopause is to just know that, Hey, if you wake up one morning and you don't feel like yourself and you feel like everything has changed, that's a thing that is, that's a perimenopause symptom, but we don't, we tell women, Oh, well, 
it's your fault. You know, you're having, you you had a bagel for breakfast every day for two years. Clearly that's what caused it. So we, we have misinformation combined with a culture that very much still values thinness and a lot of misinformation. That's the perfect storm mm. for people to have a rough ride. What's the evolutionary benefit to losing muscle mass when you age? Oh, I don't know that there is one. Um, I think that, I mean, I, I, I like where the question, I like the question, but I don't know that there is an advantage to yeah. it. Yeah. Um, I will say that there, I think there is an advantage to gaining fat mass in menopause mm -hmm. though, you know, fat tissue, adipose tissue produces a type of estrogen, not quite the same estrogen that we produce in our reproductive years, but a type of estrogen that can benefit our heart, our bones and our brain. And our bones specifically benefit from an increase in body mass in midlife and, and post-menopause. That's actually been fairly well documented. And so if we think about like, what are some potential advantages to this change that 90 plus percent of people experience that I think we can say there definitely are some, but losing muscle mass is, is a, is a more challenging one to find. Okay. That's an interesting <laughs> answer. Okay. It could, it could be because, you know, as you get older and your, your body is naturally slowing down that you need like nature wants your metabolism to be a little slower to conserve energy if you've got less muscle. Yeah. I mean, the, there's a lot of interesting theories and like full disclaimer, these are definitely, you know, theories and hypotheses about why muscle mass, the rate of muscle loss increases with age in both men and women. Like it's not just a, you know, a female thing. And it appears that as we age, you know, some things don't work as well. And one of them is building muscle. So we need a little bit more protein to uh, not a lot, not as much as diet and wellness culture tell you that you need, but probably a little bit more can help to overcome that. And in some of the research that's looking specifically at like, how can we help support building muscle? That seems to be kind of the leading hypothesis at this point is that we need a little bit more. And if we don't know that, it can just be harder to get enough. What would you say to someone listening who perhaps struggles with disordered eating? is perimenopause or going through this and wants to be able to support themselves nutritionally, but from a gentle nutrition perspective, but they're vulnerable into being pulled into the black and white thinking. Because so I'm guessing this is something you must navigate all the time with people who come and see you. How do you, how do you think about that? And I love this question because one of the, one of the reasons why I decided to kind of specialize in this area is because the gentle nutrition conversations I think become more prominent the older that you get. So somebody who is in their twenties or thirties um, may be able to set that principle kind of on the back burner for many years as they work on having a peaceful relationship with their body and food. But somebody who, you know, at 47, you know, my cholesterol went up a little bit last year. That's a really common thing within a year of menopause, 10 to 15% jump just because we're in menopause. So all of these kind of health connections to food kind of come back into the picture. And so what the way that I describe it is that we need to find a pattern of eating that is adequate, that meets your needs, that you enjoy, and that doesn't take all your capacity to do. So most of the time when people are trying to make changes with food and diet from that diet and wellness culture perspective, it's they're all in, they're giving it, they're all a hundred percent. Every thought, minute, plan, decision revolves around this. We all know that's not sustainable, but if I want to add more protein or add more fiber using those gentle nutrition principles, I need to find a pattern and I need to find ways of adding in of building those balance plates that don't involve counting, measuring, or tracking. Because as somebody who also has, you know, a disordered eating history, the minute I start thinking about numbers, my brain just goes into like, you know, perfection mode and, um, and it's just not a good place. And I'm sure you guys hear that all the time too. Like, I think there's a subset of people who can maybe at some point see those numbers as just data, but there's a lot of us who can't, and that they'll always be too triggering to ever be able to use in the way that maybe some people can. So I talk about protein as having starring roles, supporting roles, and then these cameo roles, 
or audience members. And so if you want to build a satisfying filling plate, you can either put a starring role, which might be like a piece of meat or, you know, a cup of beans or whatever it is, or you can have a couple of supporting roles, which might be like an egg or two and some hummus and some veggies and some bread. Or if you wanted to put together one with a whole bunch of little things, nuts and seeds and, you know, all the fixings, you would need many of them. So just kind of teaching people to think about them in that way, like what's going to bring main character energy to your gentle nutrition goal that is going to be the easiest to think about, require the least amount of capacity. And, you know, you can just kind of put it on there versus the, I want to get creative and I want to think about, you know, how can I make this more fun and filling and satisfying and when you have the capacity to do that, then you can kind of use that strategy. So that's kind of an example of how I teach that. So someone who might be a bit stressed, let's say about getting enough protein might say to a, Jen, how much protein should I be having? How do you answer that question when someone's pushing you to say how much, like how much is enough? Well, I mean, the first thing I always say is that unless you're an elite athlete or have, you know, really defined performance goals, most of the research is very reassuring in that it's our 24 hour protein intake that's going to matter most. So I always tell people don't stress about the individual meals unless it really impacts how you feel. So if somebody says to me, for example, oh my goodness, I think I have a good breakfast, but by 10 o'clock I'm starving and that annoys the shit out of me. What can I do? That's a totally different conversation than I want to know how much protein to have at every meal. And, you know, I might tell somebody, well, let's see if there's an opportunity to add something to your plate. Maybe it's more protein, maybe it's more carbs, maybe it's whatever, but it's really just about how can we find that balance? If somebody really kind of wants a number, because I do feel like sometimes, you know, there's, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a false profit, but people do really like that safety aspect of like, just tell me how much I'll say like a range that represents the palm of your hand to your full hand is a great guideline for a meal-based serving of protein. You don't need to know the number. You don't need to measure it, count it. But if you know that this is about 20 grams and this is about 30 to 40 grams, it's really easy to ballpark what you think you need based on how hungry you are, what your needs are, what you have access to. So I think a lot of people run away from or shy away from talking about food specifics with gentle nutrition. But one of the things that I think can be really helpful when people are in the right place is teaching them through a new lens and really focusing on how is this food helping you feel? Is it giving you the energy to do the things you want to do? Is it helping you with your health goals? Because in midlife, we have them, you know, I think we should have them, but we want them to be health and not weight as a proxy for health. Um, and that's a very different line of conversation. Mm -hmm. You can see through this conversation how whenever you're bringing in the concept of gentle nutrition, like and an, any intention around something, there's a risk all of a sudden for this over attachment to something. And I, if anyone is listening to this episode, who's not yet in perimenopause or menopause, I feel like there's, it's almost like a reason part of recovery work. If you're doing that work earlier sets you up well for this, because if we can get into the, like to remove the attachment and over identification and over moralization of these things earlier, then when we're starting to integrate that now, like, for example, when I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to, this is going to become relevant for me very soon. And, <laughs> and thank goodness that I'm not going to be contending just now, just beginning to contend with all the, this stuff that I've done some work on this, that I'll be able to say, like, I don't need to track numbers because that, that is the invitation when you read any headline about, Absolutely. you know, it's very alarmist and there's an, it's like, do I need to strength train every day? Do I need to? And I know how to kind of filter that now because I've done that work earlier. So anyone working on these concepts earlier, I think it does play a role in how menopause might end up feeling or perimenopause might end up feeling because it is a skill to stay down here, <laughs> to stay grounded in this stuff. And it's too easy, I think, if we, we haven't deconstructed these things, the diet culture and our attachment to these things, to, to let it become a, a rabbit hole of perfectionism, really. Absolutely. And the all or nothing thinking it is always there hiding just below the headline, right? So if the headline says, women in midlife need more X, then what people see and hear and read is 
then I should try and get all of it. Yeah. <laughs> and so one of the, the mindset frameworks that we use in my community all the time is lower the bar, lower the bar as low as possible. And it will probably still be good enough. Mm. And just that visual of like, I don't have to have this perfectly constructed meal every day. I don't have to worry about making my own bread from wheat that I milled in my backyard. I don't need to have the bar set so high that I don't even enjoy it anymore. Really thinking about how can we lower the bar is I think a helpful technique at any age, but especially for people who've been in that diet culture mindset for decades. I want to loop back to what you mentioned at the beginning about feeling better on the other side of menopause and how menopause, because when when I was younger, it was always referred to as the change. I can remember my mom and her friends, you go through the change. <laughs> and you was, you said something, I can't remember exactly what you said, but something about like when people move towards it, because people are finding their bodies are changing. This thing is happening to us that we're not choosing to happen. Like, how do you think about, or how do you speak to people about that? Like that encouragement to move forward into this thing that's happening as opposed to resisting it. When we resist something that we don't want, we compound our struggle Absolutely. and our suffering as well. And I, it just felt, yeah. like, I felt like I wanted to give it a bit more airspace because it just feels like a really important piece here for anyone who's in it and just feeling like it all looks a bit bleak for them right now. Yeah, and, and I do, and I, and I don't want to feel like anyone, I don't want anyone to feel gaslighted by if you're sitting in the suck of perimenopause and everything sucks. And here I am like sunshine and roses. That is not at all what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that it, it's not going to suck forever. It doesn't have to suck all the time. It's not going to suck forever. And leaning in is the difference between acceptance and resignation. So resignation is, it is what it is. And there's nothing I can do about it and feeling defeated and disempowered and acceptance is the reality is what it is. What can I do next? What is the next step? And the next step has to be moving forward, not looking back. So when I'm trying to get someone out of that, I feel awful because of how much weight I've gained and my clothes don't fit and I'm not sleeping and all that kind of stuff. And, I, and they say, I just want to feel like myself again. I really invite them to say, okay, what, what are you missing? And what, what are you happy to let go of? Cause that's the other thing about midlife is that it's such a great opportunity to let go of the things that are not serving you anymore. You know, some of the research by Dr. Lisa Moscone shows us that our brain is going through a remodeling. This is literally a renovation that is happening in your body and your brain. And you can have a say in what color the walls are going to be. Like you don't have to just paint it boring beige again. So how do we lean in and what do we add in? And so often when I say, well, how are you feeling in your body versus about your body? That also helps to bring them back into the here and now. And it's like, well, I just want to have the energy to go for a walk with my neighbor like I used to, or I just want to be able to get dressed and leave the house. Great. Those are things we can lean into and we don't have to diet to get there. So really kind of focusing on where, where do you want to be, keeping it relevant enough that they'll be able to have see the progress that they're making and really trying to see it as a transition and not an end because it's when we try and like hold on to the past or like go back in time or we've romanticized what it was like to be 30 instead of 45 forgetting how much of our life was different at 30 <laughs> compared to 45 it mm. can feel like quicksand so that's kind of one of the ways that I that I practically apply that there's there's going to be grief during this time because there's yeah. a, there's loss in it. And there's also going to be empowerment in it. There was a there was something that was floating around Instagram. I was just trying to look it up. I can't find it, but it was it was a quote by somebody that was so beautiful. I found something similar. I guess Brene Brown said it, um, who I have mixed feelings about, but she said people make may call what happens at midlife a crisis, but it's not. It's an unraveling, a time when you feel a desperate pull to live the life you want to live, not the one you're supposed to live, to let go of who you think you're supposed to be and embrace who you are. It was something of that sentiment. And that is a, again, not to deny the grief of it, because I think that that's definitely part of it. 
but that it's also this opportunity to build your new house or, or to really get clear on who we are and shed a lot of stuff that I think in our 20s and yeah. 30s, it's a lot harder. There's a lot more pressure. There's a lot more comparison. You know, those pressures are higher at younger ages, which potentially has to do with why we feel happier when we're older. Because suddenly, I think we just have more, I think we prioritize ourselves a little more. It's an opportunity to do that more. And also, I, I do think estrogen is involved. Like, I don't want to take it down to mm. like a biological, you know, plausibility argument. But estrogen, along with oxytocin, are two of the hormones involved in making us interested in taking care of things, whether that's a garden, whether that's a person, whether that's a rock, whatever, a pet, it doesn't matter. And as that shift in hormone happens, I think that there is an inward turn of our energy, of our interests. And so turning that back on ourselves at this point and saying, what do I want is a natural evolution, I think, of, of life. Mm -hmm. And such a gift, because again, when you can lean into that, lean into saying, there are some things I want to carry forward into my next season. And there are some things that I firmly want to leave behind without feeling like you're doing something wrong. Then I think it can be a really exciting time. So if you were going into perimenopause slash menopause, again, knowing what you know now, how would you, uh, how may, might you have handled it differently or what would you, what would you be thinking about? Oh gosh. In hindsight, my own experience, I wish I would have known more in my thirties. I wish I would have known that it could start in my late thirties. I wish I would have known that I would be in perimenopause long before I missed a period. And I wish I would have known that a lot of the things that we normalize because they're common aren't things that you need to suffer through. Even just thinking about like sleep changes and mood changes, how often do we dismiss it as like, oh, it's just my hormones. Okay. But you know, you're going to be hormonal probably for a lot, many more years. And so this culture of dismissing our symptoms as normal, just because they're common, I think does a, such a disservice when we're in a season of life or a phase of life that lasts for up to a decade. So that really is kind of my, my big take home is wanting to make sure that people have the resources, the education and the tools to know what's happening, but also to be able to, to move forward with it. So, you know, okay, this is happening. This is what you can do. And this is what you can't, you can't stop time. You can't reverse it even for people who are taking hormone therapy, which can be amazing, it is still not turning the menopause tap off, you know, like menopause is still coming your way. So recognizing that, um, that, yeah, that it's, it's a transition and support finding ways to feel supported in whatever way that looks like is, um, probably going to serve people well. Can we touch on hormone replacement therapy? Because I think it's a question that many people ask themselves whether to take it, whether not to take it. Yeah. If you start menopause, you're going to menopause on the younger side. Is it then more advisable? Because there seems to be a lot of talk about estrogen protects your bones. So you don't want your estrogen to drop too early. What are the kind yeah. of considerations so for people to decide? So spontaneous menopause that happens but after the age of 45 is kind of one group. Then there is the early menopause group, which is between 40 and 45, of which I'm technically in because I was 44. And then there's the premature ovarian insufficiency, which is, you know, considered premature menopause, which is any time before the age of 40. For people who go through menopause before the age of 40, the evidence is really clear, actually, that there are increased risks of not replacing hormone. So it's not considered hormone therapy. It actually is hormone replacement therapy under the age of 40 because it's replacing something that should have been there, but isn't for whatever reason. I think that that's an important you know, prevention conversation for people to have with their care providers. It's less clear between 40 and 45. I mean, my grandmother was 44 or 45 and she lived to 93 and never took hormone therapy. So it's not a slam dunk, but I think it's also helpful and empowering to be aware that if you do go into menopause earlier than expected, that you should also be keeping an eye out for maybe some of those changes that we wouldn't normally expect for another few years. What would be the changes to look out for in those situations? The big changes would be related to heart health. So cholesterol changes, blood pressure changes, 
uh, bone density, so bone changes. So currently the position statements by most major menopause organizations is that hormone therapy is primarily indicated for the treatment of symptoms in people who go into menopause at the, you know, the normal age and the prevention of osteoporosis. Those are the only really two kind of rock solid ironclad recommendations. A lot of the other claims are, I would say, in the earlier evidence stages and people do have strong opinions about them, but, you know, choosing to follow, I think the, the standard menopause recommendations is probably the safe bet at this point, mm-hmm. but it is safe. Like the, the world, the, the women's health initiative study that was released in the early two thousands scared everyone off of hormone therapy. So our generation of people who, you know, kind of really remember that because we were in our twenties, early twenties still have this pause before we think about hormone therapy, but there really has been so much data re-examined, republished that we now know that people can take it very safely for, you know, many years to help alleviate some of these symptoms. And that for most people, they don't need to worry about any long-term side effects, at least the ones that were presented as like the big bad ones, like breast cancer and things like that. Any particular stance on like uh, traditional roots versus bioidentical? It's an interesting question. And actually, if you look at most of the FDA approved hormone preparations, they are bioidentical. So for example, progesterone, that is a bioidentical hormone preparation. Prometrium is the, is the most common one. Most of the estradiol patches and gels and creams are also bioidentical. Most of the time when people say bioidentical, that what they're referring to is compounded. So I'm not sure if that's what you were referring to. Mm-hmm. So this would be these compounded prescriptions that are put together, um, kind of these unique preparations. And I feel like it's a personal choice in that if that's the route that you want to go, you can go that route. But most of the hormones that are being used in that are actually the same as the FDA approved prescription mm-hmm. versions. It's just in a custom formulation that's more expensive. That's kind of the take home for most people. Now, there will always be people who feel better with a custom one and may need it, want it for other reasons. But the the bioidentical piece, I think, has been co-opted a little bit and, uh, and, and misleads people into what they're actually getting. Okay. When you're taking it orally, it's not bioidentical. Is that right? There are some oral estradiol preparations that um, would be considered bioidentical, but the safest ones and the ones that are used most often are the transdermal ones. So if estradiol is delivered through the skin transdermally, the risks, especially around blood clots are essentially gone. And so most of, I would say the prescriptions today, I don't know what the exact number is, but certainly what I hear from people, I feel like it's a 10 to one using a topical preparation for estrogen versus oral. Well, speaking of finding, you know, having a place for support around these concepts, if this is relevant for anyone listening, luckily there are places for that. So you can feel free to share that information. Well, I, so I have a podcast, which lots of people um, have found helpful because I do bring on experts that talk about that. So the Midlife Feast podcast, and then the community that I started two years ago, which is a hub for all things, menopause, menopause, nutrition, and intuitive eating. So it really is a safe place for anybody coming from a history of an eating disorder or disordered eating to kind of step into this conversation without worrying that they're going to be sucked back into diet culture. And so um, you can find both of those links on Instagram or on the Midlife Feast. And uh, below. Yeah. So if you have any more questions for Jen, I'm sure if you dropped her message on Instagram, she will. Yeah. I would love to be able to respond or answer or point you in the right direction anyway but my goodness I feel like this could be like three episodes there's just so much information there thank you so much for coming on to the podcast and thank you for letting me ramble on you know I um I love talking about this and especially in this anti-diet space we're, we're not the majority when it comes to talking about menopause there's so much out there that is do more do harder do better And I really want to help people ease into menopause, lean into it with confidence, not resignation. And I think that food can be part of that, but we don't have to, we don't have to have that diet mentality. So thank you. Yeah. I was looking at your Instagram earlier today and you had a post about, you know, when people say, oh, intuitive eating isn't working for me. And you're like, are you actually 
practicing the principles of intuitive eating or are you just not dieting and stuck in the rebellious eating and I was reading it and I was like yes 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 exactly that <laughs> exactly that and I just uh, sometimes the oversimplification of intuitive eating online yeah winds me up so I appreciate your voice out there and everything you are putting out into the world thank you and thank you for the work that you do as well thanks very welcome thanks <laughs> thanks. And thanks for coming yeah thanks Jen <laughs>